Welcome, everybody. If you got your Bible, I want you to turn to Psalm 33 and welcome Sienna, Cyprus, downtown, the Loop, and the digital family as well. As we jump into the scriptures here in Psalm 33, we've been looking at the life of David, and we're going to continue looking at that. He's written a lot of Psalms, and this is one of the Psalms that they feel like David wrote, which would be a great thing. Let me ask you a question. Um, what are you excited about that's coming up in the rest of the year? I hope there's a lot of things. Let me tell you a couple of things I'm excited excited about. One, I love that in a few weeks at all of our campuses, we're going to have Christmas Eve service. We get the candles out, silent night. It's just beautiful and just sets your heart right for that next day of Christmas. So excited about that. Excited also about this next week with the story uh, that you were just told about, that something new we're doing. Invite folks, be a part of it Thursday through Saturday. It's gonna be a great time for us. I'm really excited about that. I'm excited about letting you know the things that are going on in Kainos and what's taking place here. So there's a lot of things to get excited about. It's always good when we look at what really fires us up, what really gets gets you excited, what really gets you going. If I was to give you something that really gets me fired up and something that really gets my wife fired up, here's what I would tell you. For me, I love any sporting event that goes down to the last seconds and then there's a win. Somehow it turns out. It doesn't matter if it's the last three-point shot, if it's the last goal. Um, I could watch the last touchdown, of course, with football. I love it. And I don't even have to know the teams. It could just be, it's happening and it's the last two minutes. You're like, well, stop everything. We got to watch this. I don't know who these people are, but we're watching them because it's coming down to the last second. And you get that last second victory, which is so cool, especially if you like the team. So let me just give you an illustration. Baylor Bears yesterday. That was a good example. That was so exciting to be able to see that last play. OSU folks, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. But it was so exciting. So that's something that really fires me up. I get excited about those last minutes in sporting contests. Now, my wife, she doesn't really care that much about that. She'll, you know, it'll be fine. But that's not really her thing. What gets her excited, I found just in the last couple weeks, is Christmas decorations on our house and flowers in the flower bed. That's what gets her really fired up. She gets really excited excited about that. Now, for me as a man, I think that's a waste of money, okay, is what I think, because uh, the flowers are going to die. And I'm always telling my kids, I'm like, we decorated the church a lot. We're there a lot. Let's don't worry about all this trouble. And, but that does not work in a marriage. I want you to know, young singles, okay, efficiency is not your goal as a husband, all right? Now, I know the flowers are going to die, but she likes them and they're beautiful and something in her, ladies, and I'm sure some guys too, that beauty of that home just pops when everybody's in that house, when it's decorated just right, when the flowers look just right. There's something in her that she just goes, yes. She doesn't care about the two minute drill that's happening on the NFL game or whatever's happening. She cares about that and I can appreciate it too. I'm just joking around, but it's just a good thing to ask the question, what really fires you up? What really makes you excited? Because there's some wonderful things to get excited about, but those are a precursor. Those are a small taste. Those are a thimble of the ocean of what really excites our soul. It's one thing to be excited about the things that we get to do. It's another thing when you realize Jesus Christ has come to save your soul, to forgive your sins, to live inside of you. So a football game, wonderful, yeah. Jesus speaking to my heart, yeah. Beautiful flowers, the joy of creation, the home filled, the home decorated, the, the bread coming out of the oven, all that, yeah but knowing that I can trust in the home that the Lord has for me in heaven. Yeah. Rejoicing on earth is just a precursor of what we'll be able to have in heaven. And I wanna show you today the Psalm 33 here of rejoicing. How are we to be people of rejoicing? Now, here we go in Psalm 33, verses one through five. This is David writing this, and here's what it says. Verse one, we'll read verses one through three, then we'll jump uh, into the rest of them after that. So here we go, verse one. Rejoice in the Lord, you righteous ones. Praise from the upright is beautiful. Praise the Lord with the lyre. That's an instrument. Make music to him with a 10-stringed harp. Sing a new song to him. Play skillfully on the strings with a joyful shout. 
The first line there, it says, rejoice in the Lord, all of you righteous ones. Here's the first point on rejoicing. Great people of God celebrate the greatness of God. Great people of God. I'm not talking about famous people of God. I'm talking about people that are great because they have trusted Jesus and they're walking with him, allowing him to use them and to be a difference maker in their lives, to allow God to move through them, to walk in obedience to Christ, not perfection, but in the best they know how of obedience. And those great people of God, that's all of us in walking with the Lord, great people of God celebrate the greatness of God. David says, rejoice in the Lord, you righteous ones. Not in your circumstances, not in the things going on, not at the end of the football game because your team won, not because the house looks pretty. Rejoice in the Lord. Great people of God celebrate the greatness of God. Now think about who is writing this. It's David and he's extending an invitation to 100% of us, all the people of God, not extroverts of God, rejoice in the Lord. Introverts of God rejoice in the Lord. Really uh, learned people rejoice in the Lord. Simple folks rejoice in the Lord. Every single person is invited to rejoice in the Lord, to praise God. It's 100% participation, 100% invitation. We've had through Kainos, we've extended. We want 100% participation, 100% engagement. Everybody jumping in, wherever, whatever, saying, I wanna go for it with the Lord and celebrate the greatness of God. David is the one that is saying this. Now, was David's life easy? We've been studying him all semester long. David's life was not easy. It was a difficult life. Let's just go over a few things we talked about. First of all, he was kind of the last of the litter, if you will. Remember when they came and they said, well, we're gonna pick out a king from Jesse's sons. And they said, well, here's my sons. Oh yeah, we got one more. We forgot about him. He was the last of the litter. We've got, then he comes to, to battle with Goliath and his brothers begin to belittle him. Say, what are you doing? Get out of here. What are you doing here? His brothers belittle him. Then the adrenaline of facing Goliath comes in his life. That wasn't easy, even though he is victorious. After that, he's hunted by Saul. So now the king's trying to kill him and he's chasing him through the wilderness. The adrenaline of facing Goliath turned into the hunting of Saul. Then finally we get further along and now he's king, but he's guilt ridden over his sin with Bathsheba. He's a murderer of Uriah in that. The pressures of fighting battle after battle after battle and war. If I would have gone through and we would have done a sermon on every single battle of David, we'd still be talking about that right now. All of these battles that he went through. Then he's got the burdens and the blessing of being king. Leadership has burdens. Leadership has blessings. Leadership has weight. Leadership has joy. And here is David with the burdens and blessings of being the king. And then finally, and we could go on and on, but my little list, the betrayal of his son, his son Absalom betrays him. So you end up with David saying, with all of those things, rejoice in the Lord, rejoice in the Lord. Now think about that. David understood something. Rejoice from the roots, not just the fruits of our faith. Rejoice from the roots, not just the fruits. So what I mean by that is that he has dug deeper and he says, not just I'm the king and everything's great. Not just I got a great palace. Not just everybody knows my name. That's all the fruits of my faith that are happening that God's blessing me with. But I wanna be down in the roots of our faith because here's the deal. Rejoicing and praising comes from the depths of God's eternal work, not just our earthly blessings. So it's not just about earthly blessings, it's about eternal work. That's why you can have the richest of the rich trust Jesus as Savior, the poorest of the poor trust Jesus as Savior. And they both can have joy in the Lord and rejoice in Him. It can be a worldwide message through any country, majorly developed, undeveloped, does not matter. It's the eternal work that Jesus Christ wants to do. And what that does is that puts rejoicing roots down deep in our life. Because here's what will happen. There will be a winter in your soul. There will be a dark night of the soul. There will be times that this thing of Christianity, you're gonna be like, I don't know if I'm gonna hang on for this. And good old fashioned perseverance and endurance is gonna have to kick in. And you're gonna have to dig down to those roots to say the roots is what I'm trusting in because I'm not seeing the fruit right now. It's winter and there's no leaves on the trees, but I'm trusting that there's a spring. Every time that you spend time in God's word, and hopefully you do it 365 days a year at least, and you spend time with God, it does not mean every time you open up this word, you just get this warm fuzzy and go, wow, that was awesome. 
I mean, have you ever read Lamentations? You know, it's a tough one, right? Just got to get through it. But if you get 300 out of 365, and you may have a year, you only get 65 out of 365, and you hang in there for the other 300, you keep walking with God because that's about the roots of your faith of letting God do something deep in you so you can make it through the winter of the soul when times are tough. Because every day is not a celebratory day. There's difficult days that happen. We just had Thanksgiving and think of how thankful, everybody's thankful, thankful, and it's awesome. But here's what we've kind of lost in America and really the whole world with Thanksgiving, but it's our American holiday. So let's talk about our country for a second. What we've lost is we have a great thankfulness for the what, but we've lost the thankfulness for the who. We're all thankful for the what, but we don't know who the who is. Who's the who? What is it? What is it that we need to be thankful for on the earth is great, but who do we need to be thankful for? Um, Emma Green wrote an article called this, Gratitude Without God. She said, although roughly percent of 90% of the US believe in God or at least a universal spirit, faith does not have much bearing on the way that Thanksgiving is talked about in public life. From Butterball turkey commercials to the Macy's parade, gratitude is present in these secular rituals, but the object of the gratitude is unclear. If people aren't thanking God, she asks, well, who are they thanking? You can thank your grandma for making a delicious pie, but who do you thank for the general circumstances of your life? So we've got the what down amazingly, that's the fruit, but the who is the root. And if you and I get the rejoicing down over the who, then the rejoicing over the fruit, then that'll take care of itself, right? That comes and goes, that ebbs and flows. But the who is what's so crucial. I love what we've seen so many life changes all the way through this Kainos initiative. I called a, a couple in our church that was going through a difficult time. And so I, I got their number and said, well, I'm just gonna call them. And um, I, I called them up. Their house had burned to the ground. They made it out safely, thankfully. They got out and they stood on the sidewalk and they watched their house burn to the ground. And this is what they said on the sidewalk. They looked at one another and one of them just said, Kainos, God's doing something new in our life. God's wanting to do something new in our hearts. That, my friend, is when the winter comes, the roots are deep. Does that mean they're happy about their house burning down? No. Does that mean they're, I hope they weren't blaming the church for their house burning down, you know, but uh, to, to be able to say, God's got something new. And they, when I was on the phone with them, I, that was, I was like, who's encouraging who on this call? They were so like, and God provided this pastor and God provided that pastor and you wouldn't believe it. And we had this opportunity to talk to our neighbor about our heart for the Lord. We had our opportunity to do this and that and God started providing. And I was like, well, look, if there's anything the church can do for you, you just say the word and we will help you in any way we possibly can. They said, we'll let you know, but we want you to know this. We're so excited about Commitment Sunday. <laughs> like what? And then I'm like, no, but we want, we're so, I said, man, this is incredible. I'm trying to bless y'all and y'all are encouraging me. What is that? That's roots that are deep down. Doesn't mean it's fun. Doesn't mean it's exciting. Doesn't mean it's what you want, but you know that God has something deeper so you can really rejoice. And David can rejoice because he's got deep roots, not just looking for the fruit. He knows the who, not just the what. Now, let me give you four things of how we rejoice. Here's the how to. Four ways that we can sincerely rejoice. I'm putting sincerely, particularly, I'm using that word because I don't want you to just, we're gonna rejoice, hey, just fake smiles. Sincere rejoicing. Look, if you will, in verse two and three, there's gonna be four things. See if you can pick them out. Number one's found in verse two, praise the Lord with the lyre and make music, that's a key, to him with a 10 string harp. Sing a new song to him and play skillfully on the strings with a joyful shout. Four things, four keys of sincere rejoicing. Here's what they are. Number one, heart. It's gotta come from your heart. It's gotta be deep down in you. It's gotta be the real deal. It can't be fake, it can't be just mustered up. It isn't personality driven. It's not circumstantially driven. It is from your heart that you sincerely are rejoicing in the Lord. Where I get that is where it says, make, praise the Lord with the lyre and make music to Him with the 10 string harp. Here's the deal. Our heart can be expressed. Music touches our emotions. We sing with all of our heart. 
That song touched my heart. I wrote this song from my heart. I hope this blesses your heart as you listen to this song. I wanna serenade you, Romeo to Juliet, and really touch your heart. There's the heartfeltness that comes. Now, you got a bad voice, so do I. But I can have a bad voice and a good heart. And a song can touch my heart. And so music touches our emotions. It's important. That's why in every culture, there is song. Every culture, there's song. It's not in every culture, everything else, but in every culture, there's song. You look back at history, there's song because we know that it touches the heart of who we are and our emotions. So if we're gonna sincerely rejoice, we gotta have the heart. Number two, newness, newness. We've been talking about that a lot these past few weeks. New things that God wants to make all things new. Jesus makes all things new. When you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior, He gives a new relationship with God, a new heart, a new cleansing. So when you open up the New Testament and read about the new covenant, you realize that you're a new creation and that you're able to walk in a new way with your new giftedness to make a new difference. Newness is fresh mercies bring fresh songs. So the newness, he says, sing a new song to the Lord. Sing a new song to Him. Now, this word new, the Old Testament is written in Hebrew, okay? We're reading it in English because if you had a Hebrew Bible right now, nobody would know what we're talking about, okay? So some, maybe a couple people, but most people wouldn't. So we've got an English Bible here. So this is a translation from Hebrew to English. Now, there's what's called the Septuagint. I don't know if that's a new word to you or not, but it's a, it's a good seminary word. Septuagint is the Hebrew that's been translated into Greek. Okay, we're reading the English version. If this was the Greek version of the Old Testament, that would be called the Septuagint. This Greek word for new, the Hebrew into the Greek from the Septuagint is the word kainos. Have you heard it before? The Greek word for new is what this is. So kainos is that word. So here it is. Sing a kainos song to the Lord. Newness is freshness. It's a freshness of God doing something new in us. Now, it's not just creativity where you have a new idea every minute. That could be just bouncing off the walls. It's a freshness in its creativity and its sincerity and it's a springtime of the soul. Now, I've been married 24 years now. And for some of y'all, you're like, hey, you're just getting started, buddy. That's just the beginning. And others of y'all are like, we measure our marriage in months. I cannot imagine being married for 24 years. Well, let me tell you this. In every marriage, you're gonna have moments you need some newness in it. And it's not a new spouse, okay? You're like, oh yeah, I need some newness. No, you don't. It's a new way with your spouse, with your faithful one that's been with you all these years. It's a new restaurant. It's a vacation. It's a getaway. It's a new look. It's a new conversation. It's a new plan. It's a new book. It's a new this. It's a new that. We all need that and we can all get into ruts in our marriages, in our parenting, in our workplace, in church, in all different things. We need to always be saying, Lord, not just creativity. Boom, 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 boom. What's the new idea? I need a newness in me. If I'm really gonna rejoice, I need some springtime of the soul and let God bring some newness and that can birth into some wonderful ideas. Hopefully you're very creative, that's a blessing. But spring is not a new idea, it comes every year. But every year we need that spring to be able to bring that newness. So the second thing of rejoicing sincerely is Lord, I want you to do something new in me. I want you to do something fresh in me. I want you to give me a new word. I want you to give me a new thought, a new vision, a new heart, a new person to minister to, a new step of obedience, a new way of seeing you, a new song in my heart, whatever it is. I want you to be able to do that, a kainos experience and experience with God. Number three is skill. He says, play skillfully on the strings with a joyful shout. Skill is our effort, our discipline, and our competency, competency that we're giving our skills as a surgeon. Lord, I give it unto you. I rejoice unto you. As a person that's, that's great with your hands and building things, I give it unto you, Lord. As a teacher, as an administrator, as a business person, as a mom, as a dad, an aunt, an uncle, a single, a uh, married, whatever it is, you give your skills to the Lord. You say, God, I'm just gonna lay it before you. You've given me this skill. You give me this gift and I'm gonna play skillfully my new song with all of my heart. I'm gonna play it skillfully before you. And then when you have, watch this come together. 
when creativity and competency come together, you got some fire there. When creativity and competency come together in your workplace, in your marriage, in your home life, whatever it is, now you got some fire burning here. If you're just super creative and you can never get it done, it doesn't matter. Just a lot of great ideas that didn't get done. If you're getting it done, getting it done, getting it done, but you never do anything new, you're not challenging yourself, well, that's not gonna work either. But when you get some newness and some creativity and you combine it with competency, now you're playing a song with your heart skillfully before the Lord. Do you see it coming together? So now I'm rejoicing because all aspects of me are coming together. I'm not just in a drudgery going to work and just doing what I've done for the past 20 years. I'm going to work with a heart, with a passion, with some creativity, and I've actually gotten better at it over these 20 years. And so now we put competency and creativity together and wham, there it is. There it is. It's when you see somebody that is in your family that, man, they can bake some cakes and those cakes come out just a little bit different, a little bit better. And you're like, this is awesome. This is so great of what's happening. When they can do something in their workplace, when they can come up with a creative idea and get it done. All of those things are great. God powerfully uses that. And fourth and finally is this, passion, passion. We rejoice because we live with passion. Look at the end of verse three. Sing a new song unto him, a kind of song unto him. Play skillfully on the strings with a joyful shout. Passion is living loud from the heart. And you could do that as an extrovert. You could do that as a talker. You can do that as a listener. You can do that as whatever it is. Passion is living from the heart. Here's what happens as we get older. We've spent so much time doing what we're supposed to do. We no longer know what we even want to do. Hear that again. We've spent so many years doing what we're supposed to do. We don't even really know what we want to do. We just keep doing what we're supposed to do. And passion is when you realize that want to starts happening and you begin to live loud from the heart because now your competency and your creativity and your heart and your passion unto the Lord, not under earth, unto the Lord, begin to be a rejoicing in your life. So now you're like, wow, okay, let's go. Let's let God do this. It's better than just a two minute drill in a football game. It's better than flowers in the yard. It's something in my soul that goes celebrate. Yes, and he says, then shout joyfully to the Lord. The church is an amazing place. In church, we can weep with those who weep and we can rejoice with those who rejoice. We can go to a funeral service and we can just have our hearts touched so much that tears are flowing from our eyes. We wanna come around that family and friends and support them and it hurts. And we can be in a place that we celebrate a baptism or somebody comes to Christ or something happens. It's just like, yes. That's church, that's an amazing thing. We can be quiet and reverent and really ponder and really think. And then we can celebrate and we can sing and we can be excited and, and be loud and be able to do that. Church is a wonderful place where you get a spectrum of emotions. You don't get that at the mall. You don't get that at, at the football game. You don't get that everywhere you go. But church, it gives all of this because God is with us in every one of those places and wants to touch and move our hearts and guide us in every one of those places. Sometimes the football stadium is where all the loudness and fun is and church is where it's quiet and boring. But this just said, shout to the Lord. Shout with joy to God. And so people see church is boring and the football stadium is exciting. So they choose NFL over G-O-D on Sunday. They're like, I know that's gonna be boring. It's gonna be long. I'm gonna go over here and I'm gonna go do this because it'll be exciting and, and new and all these things. Let me tell you what, the football stadium is not as exciting as the church house because this is where the real business gets done of God doing His work. Now, I love, you know, when you ever, you kind of start listening to your kids' music a little bit, you get kind of uh, like some new songs in you. So we've been listening lately and I love this to a song by Elevation Worship and it's called It Might Get Loud is the name of it. Here's what it says. Excuse me for a minute, but I've got a song to sing. It may not be on key, but it's from my heart. Once they hit that line, I was in. Hook, line, and sinker at that point. It might not be on key, but it's from my heart. And no one else can tell it. What the Lord has done for me, this might take all day, so I better start right now and it might get loud. 
It might get loud. Heaven's coming down, 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 and it might get loud. It might get loud. Heaven's coming down, 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 and it might get loud. You have a story to tell that I can't tell for you, only you can tell for you. Let me tell you what, in the church, it might get loud. We ought to be walking into church instead of saying it might be boring, it might be long, and come in and say, it might get loud today. It may get loud in the congregation, but it might get loud in me. It may get loud in my ears. It may get loud in my heart. This could be the moment God answers that prayer we've been praying. This could be the moment that that song touches my heart. This could be the moment I see a scripture that I've never seen before. This could be the moment that I hear from God and it might get loud. Letting David in 2 Samuel chapter six, when he danced before the ark and Michael, his wife said, why did you do that? And he said, I'll become even more undignified than this as I celebrate the things of God. It might get loud when we see the rejoicing happen in a great, great way. And those four things, and I'm gonna give you the last part and I know myself well enough, I only got one blank left for you and then the four points are already printed because I knew I would preach like point one, like for 20 minutes and be like, I gotta get three more things in there, right? Because I understand my passion, I understand my heart. So here we go, we're gonna hit these next four fast, here we go. We need to understand the why behind the what. We need to understand the why behind the what. Why do we rejoice, not just what do we rejoice for? And here's what it says in verses four through five. You ready? Might get loud. Here we go. Verse four, for the word of the Lord is right. Hear that. The word of the Lord is right. Washington, D.C., the word of the Lord is right. Austin, the word of the Lord is right. City Hall, the word of the Lord is right. My own life and heart, the word of the Lord is right. Things that I disagree with, the word of the Lord is right. If I'm wrong, it's because I'm not on the word of the Lord because the word of the Lord is right. So why do we rejoice? We rejoice with great news. I tell you that, not with a scowl, not with a pointing finger. I'm not trying to poke anybody in the eye. I tell you with a heart, the word of the Lord is right. So I'm gonna rejoice on that and go wow on that. Do you ever notice on football games nowadays, you know, everybody kind of does whatever uh, they've watched done throughout their time. They're watching football as a kid, so they go and do the same touchdown dance, uh, you know, that they do and they kind of react. So here's what happens. It'll happen today. It'll happen nine times today. You watch it happen. And this is what'll happen. Somebody will be running for a pass. The defensive player will shove the guy down and then the ball will hit the ground and they'll throw a yellow flag, pass interference, right? The defensive player will see the yellow flag come down. He'll go, <laughs> what, what? Whoa, whoa, what are you, whoa? And they'll show it up on the big screen. He shoved the guy five yards before the ball got there. Ah, ah, ah. Whoa, whoa. Ah, whoa. Watch, it'll happen all day long. And the coach will be like, brother, it's, it's, you're wrong. Only person that'll be going, whoa, 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 is his mama in the stands. That's it, okay? That's the only other person that's agreeing with this. Everybody else knows. And how many of us, we're in our scriptures and we're hearing the word of the Lord and we're knowing what God wants. We're like, what, 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 ah, what, ah. Hey, there's no instant replay on this, brother. God got it right the first time. And the word of the Lord is right. And great rejoicing comes when we receive that and say, thank you, Lord. Instead of saying, what? We say, yes, the word of the Lord is right. And if you say it and I'm not doing it, I'm the wrong one. You're the right one. The second thing that rejoicing the why behind the what, the word of the Lord is right is he loves righteousness and justice. He loves both of those things put together. He wants to see justice in our world. He wants to see righteousness in our world. He sees both those together. And then third and finally, the earth is filled with his love. The earth is filled with his love. How is the earth filled with his love? It's filled with his love because of his omnipresence. He's everywhere. He could be in the depths of the oceans or he could be uh, in the airplane with you while you're flying 30,000 feet. He's everywhere. But the earth is also filled with his love by this. It's filled with his love by us going out and making a difference in the world. As Christians go out and shine the love of Jesus and rejoice, it fills the earth with his love. 
Hey, thanks for watching. To find out more about Houston's First, you can subscribe to our channel or you can go to houstonsfirst.org.